Five minutes after 10 o'clock. Thank you for tuning in. It's, a, it's amazing how much of our lives are um, affected greatly by people who take their time and dedicate it to the written word, um, whether it's news or, or, or fiction. Um, we, we're greatly affected when, when a character um, that is fictional becomes kind of a part of our lives. That's even maybe more uh, amazing. We have just down the road, we have a Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings home. And people go there all the time. It, it's, a, it's a national landmark, I believe. It's definitely a state park. And, and people go there all the time. And why do they go there? Because they love her books. They love her characters. They want to see the place. And, and really, all it is is a little house. And they still have the typewriter sitting there, right? Exactly. I've it's always, amazing. I've always loved biographies. And um, this is, a, we're going to talk about a, a writer right now. Um, Harper Lee is the writer. The book is called Mockingbird. And Charles J. Shields wrote this really well done biography of, of Harper Lee. Charles himself is an American biographer of, biographer of mid-century novelists. So this is something he focuses on. He's the co-founder of the Biographers International Organization. And uh, my favorite type of book is biographies. I don't know why. I just love seeing how, re how real people lived their lives, even if they were creating fictional people. Uh, Charles Shields, good morning, sir. How are you? I'm well, Larry. How about you? Pretty good. Where are you calling from? Charlottesville, Virginia, the home of Thomas Jefferson, right at the foot of the Blue Ridge Mountains. Oh, wow. oh man, isn't that a beautiful nice. area? That's a beautiful area. Yeah. So, so you've you've done biographies of writers before. Was the, was this a little bit different in any way to write about Harper Lee? Well, it, it was different because she dropped out of sight in 1964. That was a pretty cold trail. Um, I wrote a biography of Kurt Vonnegut, and he was very eager to cooperate. Uh, in fact, Kurt would call me out of the blue at home to ask how the biography was coming. But uh, Harper Lee, on the other hand, um, frankly did not want a biography written about her because she, uh, she's a person who never liked the limelight. She didn't like being famous. so. I, uh, I decided to be discreet and be a gentleman throughout the whole process. And I know that she read the book because when I was down in Alabama last week, someone showed me a signed copy autographed by Harper Lee of my biography. Oh, that's wow. crazy. Oh, isn't that, that's great. That must have made your day. <laughs> it did. I was so surprised. I really was. Yeah, well, we've had a couple of biographers on before of, um, who wrote biographies of, of living people, and they don't always get such a great. They don't always like the books. Not that they they wrote anything bad about them, but they just it's it's kind of always difficult. They're big fans usually of their work, and then to find out that the person they wrote about didn't like it. So that I mean, I'm sure that was something you were very happy to 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 learn. Right. Well, you know, everybody has a narrative of their own life, um, the way they they think that it went and what their motives were, and sometimes. When somebody looks at a life from the outside, they see patterns that a person wasn't aware of or, uh, you know, episodes that were painful uh, that the person may not want to remember. So it, it, it's different when you're a biographer. The key thing is you have to empathize with who you're writing about. You have to understand yeah, that yeah. No, nobody, nobody comes into this life with a blueprint about how to live life the right way. So you have to step back and give people the benefit of the doubt. Did you learn anything about Harper Lee when you were researching her? that kind of made you see a light and, and say, oh, that's where this part of the story came from, or that's, oh, that's where this character is developed from. Did, did anything connect with you from the fictional work to, to her real life? Oh, sure. Uh, for her character, she looked up and down South Alabama Avenue in Monroeville, Alabama, where she was raised to, to create the story and to create the book. But, you know, fiction is not autobiography. That's something else. Autobiography is a memoir or yeah. autobiography. But um, what she did was she compressed characters and she compressed incidents. But one thing that's very true in the book is herself. She is the character Scout. And Atticus is, the character, is uh, based on her father, A.C. Lee, who was an attorney and a liberal at that time in the South. And the little boy next door, Dill, uh, he is modeled on Truman Capote, who was her best friend growing up. Oh wow! Was she was she instrumental in uh, who was the actor again? Gregory Peck was that? Am I correct? Gre Gregory Gregory Peck who pay, played Atticus. That's right. And, and in fact, the movie would not have been made had Gregory Peck not paid for about half the production costs because in 1960, a lot of studios thought that it was just too small film. It was they thought it was arty and. Uh, 
and nobody else would step forward. Although one studio did say, we'll make it if you put Bing Crosby in the lead role as Attic. Oh, oh wow. and did she want that too, or did Harper want that? Or no. 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 <laughs> no, 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 and then the, their second suggestion was Rock Hudson. Oh, gosh. Oh, okay. Well, well, Gregory Peck is sort of a Rock Hudson kind of a guy, isn't he? He's more edgy. Yeah, he, more edgy? Yeah, yeah he, I think he's more oh, edgy. Oh, yes, and he was a box office uh, heartthrob in those days, you know, so uh, he, had, he had a lot of integrity with viewers. He was the right, right person for that role. Um, so what were the challenges that you faced? Uh, uh, were you able to interview her directly? No, uh, she would she did not consent to any interviews, and she told some people not to talk to me. And because she's never dedicated, she's never given her papers to any library or anything like that. I had to do a lot of oral history. I mean, I had to dig back into the people that she knew when she was growing up, and uh, her sorority sisters at the University of Alabama, people who knew her when she lived in New York. But one really good thing about doing the life was that she remained friends with Capote. And, and if I could find Capote on the scene, some, oftentimes not too far away was Harper Lee. And in fact, I think one of the most interesting chapters in the book is the one where they're out in Kansas researching in cold blood. Mm-hmm. What, what that the, was amazing. The nation's uh, become more of a movie nation than a book-reading nation, I, I think. I don't know if, if you agree with that. But, but at the time that To Kill a Mockingbird came out, I think it was kind of half and half. We were... We were still readers and, and, and moviegoers at the same time. Uh, do, do you think that the book was so popular because readers were still uh, anxious for, for good books? I think it was uh, largely due to timing. Um, just think, in 1960, we were on the cusp of the Civil Rights Movement, and along comes a book that takes a not-so-hysterical tone toward change and instead views... Uh, good and bad people through the eyes of a nine-year-old child. So it, it's a reassuring book. And for that reason, I think maybe we need to teach it a little differently in schools now. You know, some black Americans read that book and they're offended because the, the black characters have uh, been kind of flat. They, they seem to be there just as extras. Um, even if you teach this book today to young people, or if you read it, you really have to keep in mind the time. It's 1930 in the segregated South, and things operate under a certain law and custom. Yeah, well, I, and the same so the same sentiments have been expressed about uh, the lady I was referring to, the uh, Mar- Mar- Marjorie Kinnon Rawlings, mm-hmm. uh, who has a home here, not too far from where we're speaking, mm-hmm. or had yeah. a home, had a home, I should say. Uh, what kind of uh, relationship did she did Harper Lee have with the editor? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, she brought. Go Set a Watchman, which just came out this year. She brought that's the original version of To Kill a Mockingbird. She brought that manuscript to an, an editor in her sixties named Tay Hohoff. Uh, Harper Lee was living in New York and never published anything. She was a reservationist for Eastern Airlines, and she brought that manuscript to Tay Hohoff, and Ms. Hohoff told her it needed work, that it you know it had problems with structure, and uh, sometimes the tone is kind of hectoring. So they worked through the book of three different drafts and made it to kill a mockingbird. Um, and that's added to some of the confusion. I mean, when the book, when Ghost at a Watchman came out this year, people thought, this is the sequel? Atticus has turned into a racist? Well, no, and the, that, right, book was right, right. First, that book was written first in the 1950s, and, and Atticus is typical of a lot of white Southerners. Yes, he's a racist. Yes, he's a segregationist. Hmm. Oh, that's interesting stuff. Yeah, I remember that story when it, when it came out. Um, was she um, discriminated against because of, uh, she was a woman writer? Was that part of her story? No, I, I don't think that really came into play. If you're if you're wondering why the name uh, is on the book is Harper Lee and not her full name Nell Harper Lee, it's only because she didn't like how people would mispronounce her first name as Nellie. Oh, her, okay. her, her name is N E L L E. So it's kind of a gender gender neutral name. But no, actually, I think because she was a woman, she formed a very close relationship with her her, her editor, who was a woman old enough to be her mother, and the two of them were very close. Um, was there a, a copyright issue? Was somebody trying to uh, get the, actually steal money from her? Yes, unfortunately, uh, the, the first version of my biography ended in 2006. That that came out that year, and um, after that, in the last ten years of Harper Lee's life, there was a lot of litigation and a lot of confusion. 
a lot of fighting with their, her hometown over trademark and copyright. Uh, what happened was is that her elder sister, Alice Lee, who was 103 when she died in November 2014, was the buffer between Harper Lee and the outside world. Uh, Alice Lee was an attorney, and she handled all of her sister's affairs. Well, as Alice began to fa fail, her uh, sister's affairs uh, you know, went more and more into the hands of a younger attorney and an aggressive agent who had Harper Lee sign some things she should not have signed. Oh, oh my oh, gosh. Wow. Uh, so we'll take a little break and we'll be right back. If you have any questions, this would be a good time to call the number 622-9622. The book we're talking about is titled Mockingbird. It, it is uh, from Charles Shields, our guest, and it is, of course, a portrait of Harper Lee. And Harper just died this year, earlier this year, right? Yes. Just passed, That's right. away, just passed away. We'll take a little break. We'll be right back. The weather is brought to you by MyFWC.com. Safe boating is no accidents. Sunshine mixing with clouds and warmer this Monday with a shower or thunderstorm around during the afternoon and evening hours. High 85 along the coast, 91 inland. Partly cloudy skies later Monday night, low 68 inland, 74 along the coast. For Tuesday, a mix of sun and clouds with a couple of showers and a thunderstorm. They'll arrive during the afternoon hours over the interior. High 84 the coast, 90 inland. From the Florida Weather Center, I'm meteorologist Joe Lundberg. Here's what you may have missed on the John Tesh Radio Show. 80% of the super rich people in his study made a habit of associating with other success-minded individuals. They also consciously avoided toxic negative people. It's nobody's business whether you're married, engaged, or starting a family because that's considered pregnancy discrimination. Dark chocolate contains more antioxidants called flavanols than any fruit or vegetable out there. Surprised? Intelligence for your life on the John Tesh Radio Show. Don't miss this stuff. Good credits, bad credits. It's none of our business because we're not an auto dealer. We're not a bank. We're not your mother. We're OcalaForSale.com. Marion County's marketplace for cars, trucks, and SUVs. We've got thousands of sellers standing by to take your call. No middleman. But hurry, don't walk, don't run. Just sit down and log on to OcalaForSale.com. License and inventory change daily. Offer does not include dealer up charge. Undercutting rust proofing factory surcharge or delivery fee. See website for details. All right, thank you. 18 minutes after 10 o'clock. Thank you for tuning in. Charles J. Shields is on the phone up in Virginia at the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains. And uh, that's a nice setting to have in your mind, isn't mm -hmm. it? Uh, and he's written the book called Mockingbird. It's a portrait of Harper Lee. The, uh, the, the thing I wondered about is, was she an integral part of the, the play and the movie uh, of, that were made from the book? Well, as, as a courtesy, the, the people who made the original movie approached her and asked her if, they, if she wanted to write the script. And I, I think they had their fingers crossed behind her back, that, you know, behind their back that she wouldn't want to do it because uh, writing for movies and writing for fiction is quite different. Uh, and instead they engaged Horton Foote, who was uh, Shelby Foote's cousin. Shelby Foote is the famous Civil War historian. Oh, wow. And Horton Foote was a, a dramatist who had grown up in a small Texas town and just took the novel and ran with it. But there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence there. I mean, you can't watch the movie and say that you've read the book. Uh, Visual stories are different from printed stories, and Horton Foote dropped out some people and some episodes that would have slowed the movie down. Plus, Gregory Peck uh, paid for uh, half of that movie. Uh, he loved it. He, he thought it was worth making, uh, but he had creative control over it as well. And he brought the character Atticus forward. Atticus is the central figure in that film, as well he should be. And there's less emphasis on the children like there is in the book. Hmm. Uh, you had... Uh uh, in in your uh, uh, research, you had discovered some articles about the clutter murders. I've not heard about those. That was that was an interesting situation. Um, as I said earlier, Truman Capote and Harper Lee grew up side by side in Monroeville, Alabama. Only a, a low rock wall separated their properties, and they were best friends. Truman went to New York as a very young man and became famous with uh, movies like uh, Breakfast at Tiffany's. Uh, and when uh, he was up there, uh, he was invited to go out to Garden City, Kansas. Um, so, you know, he was assigned an article by the New Yorker to go out and cover the unexplained murders of a farm family. Uh, two teenage uh, children and their parents were killed inexplicably uh, for no apparent reason uh, by persons unknown. So Truman was sent out to do a story on a traumatized small town in Kansas that was dealing with the loss. And he asked 
true. He, he, he asked Harper Lee to go along with him because he, first of all, was uncomfortable going out to Kansas. Uh, if you remember Truman Capote, he was yeah. a small, uh, rather effeminate man, and he was worried how he would go over. So he brought out Harper Lee with him, and she was his research assistant. And uh, only recently I discovered by combing newspapers out there a reference to the fact that she wrote up the case for the FBI magazine, The Grapevine, uh, as a favor to Truman and to curry favor with the FBI out there, whom they were working with. She wrote up a long feature story about what they were doing and what Truman had uncovered, but it didn't come to light because she didn't put a byline on it. And the reason was is that she didn't want to crowd Truman. Truman was very sensitive, had a big emotional hole in him, and Harper Lee wanted it to be just his gig. He didn't. She didn't really? want to crowd it. Is the emotional hole another way of saying ego? I mean, was it e- uh-huh. an ego? No, uh, Harper's parents, you know, if you read To Kill a Mockingbird, uh, Truman is, the, the character Dill is based on Truman Capote, and Dill is a little boy who's rather lonely, and he says several times in the book, my folks don't want me. And that's true. Uh, Truman's hmm. parents didn't want him. They were high rollers, and they loved parties, and as a result, they dumped him on some elderly cousins in Monroeville, and uh, he grew up a very lonely little boy. In fact, one time when his mother came to visit him and then drove away, he discovered that she had left some perfume behind and he drank it, so oh. that uh, her 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 essence would be part of him. Oh wow! So so I mean, is it fair to say that uh, in cold blood was at least started? I mean, sh- uh, Harper Lee, st- I guess, lit the match or did the kindling wood for that story? Well, it was it was Truman's assignment, but I have to say this: you know, considering how much she really put into that book and the notes that she took for Truman and the interviews that she did. Uh, if this were a just world, it would be in cold blood by Truman Capote with Harper Lee. Yeah, that but makes. By that, but, but by that time, she had won the Pulitzer Prize, and he was he was so jealous. <laughs> Truman wow. was so, so. Oh, so there is an ego thing in there. That's interesting stuff. Oh, yeah. That's why yeah. I love biographies. It, what what attracts you to biographies in general? Is that is that the same kind of thing? Well, I started reading them when I was in college. I I thought I wanted to be a writer, and so I began reading biographies of writers to figure out how the heck they did it, <laughs> ah. what, what their life what their life was like, how did they you know break into publishing, and I found that the the intelligence or the creativity behind the book was as interesting as the book itself. Uh, did, so that's why I became a literary biographer. And and did she um she she had her own. Uh sets of rejections early on, didn't she? I mean, you you don't jump right into any any writing career. Exactly. You know, she she was in New York for eight years as an airline reservationist and published nothing because she was afraid of rejection. In fact, she walked around the office building of her future publisher twice before she could get up the nerve to take her manuscript in. Mm. And when they told her, when they told her that it needed to be reworked, that's where a lot of young writers step off. Instead of... Um, yeah, yeah. You know, hanging in there, they say, hey, well, look, you know, I've worked on it a long time, and if this isn't good enough, I give up. But instead, she worked with her editor and put it through three drafts, and it's to her credit. That that has a lot to do with making it in this world, perseverance. Yeah, I, I mean, in today's world, you go back to your computer, and you can move words around, but the back then, I mean, you literally had to type the whole thing over again. Mm-hmm. Exactly. In fact, you know, once she was so despairing of To Kill a Mockingbird, she was on the third draft, and she was absolutely sick of it. And she was alone in her apartment on a snowy night, and she took the whole thing, threw it out, in the win- out the window into the alley. And she called her editor and said, I don't want to be a writer anymore. It's too hard and it's too lonely. Hmm. Oh, my gosh. So what was her personal life like? Well, she's always been a, a bit of a loner, and that's because she is just herself. Uh, when you read To Kill a Mockingbird, Scout is Harper Lee in miniature, someone who speaks her mind, yeah, somebody who's yeah. very plain-spoken, and you know she never looked over her shoulder for approval. Did she did she embrace the fame that came along with the the hit book? How many? Well, she's like, is this the biggest selling book in America? The To Kill a Mockingbird. Yeah, you know, really, To Kill a Mockingbird is the 20th century Huckleberry Finn. I mean, it's just it's part of the American canon, and and hundred thousand kids a year read it in high schools. Uh, she was overwhelmed, frankly. Yeah, I mean, her editor her editor told her that the book might not be all that popular because it involved rape and racism. And um, instead, it became a tremendous hit. Uh, she hung in there through the creation of the movie, but in 1964, she had just had enough of the pressure. You know, how's the next book coming along? And are we going to see Atticus again? And she withdrew. 
Do you think that uh, this book is going to be embraced by students uh, like 20 years from now? Uh, go set a watchman or to kill a mockingbird? Uh, to kill a mockingbird. It will be, if, but it has to be taught in a different way. You, you can't hand this book out now to a public school that's as diverse as schools are now and, and give them a white hero with no explanation of what the times were like. I mean, uh, some black Americans are offended by that book because uh, the black characters in it are sort of cutouts. They seem to be there for the sake of the white people, mm-hmm. and, you know, to do things for them. And, and Tom Robinson, who's on trial, is um, a very good man who gets not much play. So if you're going to teach To Kill a Mockingbird, you've got to talk about the times. You've got to put it in context. This is a segregated America, and that little town works on a combination of custom and prejudice. Yeah. How, how, how did it affect you when she died? Well, I still have dreams about her because um, I felt like I knew her and uh, I, I knew everything about their family. Um, when I finished the book, I sent her sister Alice all of the public documents that I had gathered about their family, about an inch and a half of public records on the Civil War and genealogy. Uh, to show you know, that I meant well, and I got a nice note from Alice saying, well, you certainly have done your research. And they're both gone now. Oh my God! Well, that's good. That's when did Alice die? Alice died in November of 2014 at age 103. Oh my goodness! Wow. And, and how old was Harper Lee when she died? Uh, 86, I think. Oh, uh, wow. if my arithmetic is right. Yeah. Oh wow. I mean, Everybody thought everybody thought she wouldn't last long after Alice died because the two of them were inseparable. So when did they never they, ne- when they did, never married and they lived together? When did your book come out? And that doesn't that sound right? I mean, this just sounds like two sisters would would just stay together like that. But what, when did your book actually come out? Well, the first version came out in 2006, and this revision just came out this week. And there's 50,000 new words in there, oh. and it brings everybody up brings everybody up to date on what happened in the last decade of Harper Lee's life. I got gotcha. you. Okay. So you have new uh, facts in here about Harper Lee then that was not uh, made public before. Right, exactly. You know, it's interesting. As I went around on book tours, the first time the book came out in 2006, people would come up and tell me stories about her, people who knew her. So I took their names and I took down the information and, and that added to the filling out the story in the second version because I met a lot of people. Hmm. And so has her, uh, I don't know, her, her physical, where, where she lived, has that become like a, a landmark or, or a museum or something? People go down to Monroeville every year and it's happening right now to see the performance of To Kill a Mockingbird right there in the courthouse. And um, that old beautiful courthouse in Monroeville, Alabama, is kind of a shrine to a lot of people. When you go inside, people take their hat off, hats off reflexively and whisper because it's almost a church-like feel about it. You know, it's that iconic. About 25,000 people a year go down to Monroeville to see that little town. Wow. What would have happened if uh, Go Set a Watchman, as it was originally, was released and it didn't turn into go To Kill a Mockingbird? Oh, well, uh, two scenarios, I guess. Harper Lee would have been discouraged, or um, she may have, you know, tried a different tact on a different subject. But I think throughout her life, she had one story to tell, and it was her love for her father, how much she respected him. And To Kill a Mockingbird is a little girl's love, and uh, Go Set a Watchman is a woman who's 28 and forgives her father for being a flawed man. Hmm. Wow. What a fascinating! I, I just love this kind of stuff. Uh, I have a copy of Charles Shields' book titled "Mockingbird." Call me if you want the copy that was sent to us, and you're welcome to it. The rest of us will have to go buy it. Uh, Charles, you have a website? Yes, it's charlesjshields.net, and Shields is S H I E L D S. Okay. Charlesjshields.net. All right, excellent. We already have it on the guest list. If you go to WOCA.com and you'll and you go to the guest list, you'll see Robin put it there. Uh, and I'm guessing it's on Amazon and all the other, other, all the other places. But you got to get the new one, right? The old one is missing 50,000 words. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. The old one is old hat now, fish wrapper. <laughs> <laughs> Charles, thank you for being on the air with us today. It was insightful. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. We'll be right back. Fox News Radio, I'm Pat O'Neill. Presidential frontrunners Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump confident they can gain more ground in tomorrow's Indiana primary. This voter likes Ted Cruz. One thing about um, Senator Cruz is 
he seems to stand stand up and do what he says he's going to do. This man likes Donald Trump's negotiating skills. Basically what Donald's saying is, if I'm going to give an inch, you're going to give me something back. Polls are split on picking a GOP winner in the state. Most May Day demonstrations yesterday for immigrant and workers' rights were peaceful, but they turned violent in Seattle. Police Chief Kathleen O'Toole says officers had to do something. The demonstrators put some innocent people in uh, jeopardy, so we had to take action. Five officers were hurt, none seriously. Fox Radio's Tanya J. Powers. A solar-powered plane took off today from Mountain View, California, headed to Phoenix as it continues its round-the-world trip. It will make two more stops in the U.S. before crossing the Atlantic. Fox News. We report. You decide. Square Trade does not cover lost or stolen items. Savings based on two-year iPhone plan with one claim compared to a tree and total equipment coverages of August 10, 2015. Getting a new iPhone, Galaxy, or other smartphone? Get this. Every two seconds, one of us accidentally breaks our phone. So protecting your new smartphone is a smart idea. But instead of getting phone insurance through your wireless carrier, here's a new way to save hundreds of dollars. I'm Steve Abernathy, and I founded Square Trade to give you a better choice. Insurance from your wireless carrier can cost you as much as $11 a month, plus up to a $199 deductible when you break your phone. Square Trade phone protection is less than $5 a month with a much lower deductible. We can save you over $240. Drops, spills, accidents, malfunctions, we cover it. That's why we have an a rating from the Better Business Bureau and are trusted by over 18 million customers. So protect your new phone with Square Trade and start saving today. Protect your new phone with Square Trade and you can save over $240. Go to squaretrade.com. That's squaretrade.com. I'm so. Hi, I'm Seth with AA Lock, Dock, and Security. Have you ever thought about the locks or security on your house or business? Have you ever wondered why the keys to your new car cost so much? Well, at AA Lock, Dock, and Security, we can help with securing your valuables. We can even replace those expensive transponder keys. We can give you the knowledge that no one else will. Call AA Lock, Dock, and Security at 867-1965. That's 867 867-